Hello everybody, my name is Henk de Burg. I'm a professor at the University of Sheffield and a director of the Prokhorov Centre. I'm here in the University of Sheffield's Firth Hall to interview the novelist John Lanchester. John, welcome to the Prokhorov Centre and to Sheffield. Thank you very much, great pleasure to be here. Uh, John, you are primarily known as a novelist, I suppose. Your most famous book, uh, which I think has been described as uh, the great London novel of the 21st century, is called Capital which is set around the time of the financial crisis, 2007-2008, but you've also written non-fiction books about this. One of the books is called Whoops, Why Everyone Owes Everyone and No One Can Pay, uh, and a more general study, which is a kind of dictionary with a very long introduction and then I think a significant afterwards, uh, afterward as well, which is called How to Speak Money. Uh, I want to focus on your non-fiction work in, in, in this interview and talk about the financial crash of 2007-2008 and then ask the question, where are we now ten, 10 years later? Perhaps the best way into this really difficult topic is by contrasting what people call, I think, the real economy, which is sort of the stuff-based economy, I guess, and the virtual economy. Can you explain a little bit more what the difference is between those two and how they work and interrelate. Well, when people think about the real economy, it's a it's much easier thing to get your head around because it's the things we make, the things we do, the things we buy, the things we sell, um, our, our labour and what we're paid for it and the stuff we, we buy with it. And, and the, other, the other economy, um, the financial economy, is, is what happens to the money that goes into the system. Uh, and that's a lot more complicated, a lot more opaque and, and the, the weird thing is, the thing that's hard to get your head around, even when you know it very well, is that it's also much bigger. Um, so if you think, for instance, about um, financial derivatives, which are the things that derive their value from something else, um, which are an old thing, um, and if you, you know, the simplest way of thinking of a derivative is maybe like a, a farmer who's got a wheat crop coming mm -hmm. in in the autumn, and he's anxious about the yield, the weather's unpredictable, he knows he's got a family to feed, he knows he's got expenses, um, but he doesn't know how much he's going to earn come the autumn. So he sells the right to his wheat in advance. So he sells in March, his crop for September uh, is flogged. And then the right to own that wheat derives its value from the original thing. It's a derivative. And the crucial thing is, if you're the farmer and I've bought the right to your wheat, I can now sell that on to someone else. And the person I sell it, to, can sell it back to someone else and that can move all around and it still doesn't affect it's still your wheat crop and it's still coming it's going to be cut down in September but the thing that derives from it the contract is being sold and traded and its value is fluctuating at some point they think you know um, the weather forecast looks terrible there's going to be less wheat than usual actually that makes the existing contracts more valuable the price goes up suddenly the weather changes it's vis everything's visibly growing out the window um, the likely, there's likely there's an abundant crop, and that means the value of the thing in advance has dropped. Does so the complexity then come from the fact that you then get layers and more layers and more layers on that? So you have that, and then your insurance, as it were. Exactly. Uh, and then you can insure the insurance, or you can sell the insurance to someone else, and then you sell the insurance, but then someone else thinks, oh, this might go wrong and he sells it on or insures it. Is, is that the complexity of the system? It's exactly like that, because once it turns into a financial instrument, once you start, instead of making money out of flogging your wheat, you're actually making money out of money, as you say, out of insurance, reinsurance, people hedging against various different likelihoods and probabilities, people lumping together bundles of these contracts and then selling them on uh, around financial markets. And it's much more complicated and it's also, and it's much more opaque, and it's also much, much bigger. That's, that's the strange thing, but the, that market in derivatives and second order financial instruments is, is gigantic compared to the actual things we do, the things Which we make. Which then also means that if something goes wrong there, it goes wrong bigly, as Donald Trump yes. would say, and the impact on the economy as a whole, the world as a whole, is much stronger. I still, uh, like most people, I suppose, find it incredibly difficult to get my head around this. So maybe let's try and ex uh, uh, explore this historically, because of course the financial capitalism we're talking about is not a new phenomenon. So let's talk about the Wall Street crash of 1929 and s look at how that came into existence and then we compare it with the crash of 2007-2008.
Why did the crash of 1929 happen? I don't remember. I mean, I think there's a variety of different explanations. By the way, just on that point, just to make you think about the numbers. Sure. Um, the total world economy in terms of GDP, gross domestic product of things that are actually made and produced, is about $75 trillion. The market in derivatives that are traded directly between part, what they call over-the-counter, that's me selling things to you and vice versa, um, which is opaque and, um, you know, it's sort of much less regulated because by nature of things, a contract between two parties is a, you know, it's between those two parties. But, but that market, the best current estimate, is that it's $566 trillion. Good heavens. Now that is an almost impossible number for human beings to imagine. Yes. And it's seven and a half times bigger than the actual economy that's to do with real, real things. Um, and, you know, even when you're completely familiar with that fact, it's still very difficult to get your head around. Um, now the 29 crash, um, I genuinely don't remember. Um, uh, I know that it had the, all the... I mean, it was a bubble. It was, you know, shares yeah. running up. Um, so people have bought all sorts of shares, driving up the prices. Thing. And there's a famous thing, there's a famous warning sign um, in financial markets when, you know, the cab driver and the barber start saying, you know, oh, you heard about this guy who made money in the shares and I'm thinking about blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're starting to have it with things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency at the moment. Um, when it's sort of, when things tip over into the popular culture in that way, that's always a warning sign. Um, and there was, um, the, the world had a very, very inflexible financial system because uh, all the main currencies were linked to gold. Um, and uh, it meant that you could have wild imbalances in the flow of money. One of the things that people say in defense of the complexity and size and scale I was just talking about, uh, a thing that's said in defense of that is that it makes money much more liquid. Mm -hmm. Enormous amounts of money can move incredibly quickly, um, which is actually, I think, we're seeing a bit of, in many cases, a mixed benefit. But it is true that the money moves much faster. Yeah. Whereas in the world that was on the gold standard, that really wasn't true because currency was linked to the physical amount of gold held by, held by governments. Um, and that meant when you had imbalances in trade and imbalances in, in credit, that it was very, very difficult to fix. And so my and at the same time, it went, it went terribly wrong in 1929. It did. You had ordinary people buying all these shares because the prices kept yeah. going up. So you could buy shares on Monday and then, as it were, be a rich man on, on, on Friday. But then, as you say, there was a bubble, the mar you know, and the whole thing collapsed. And then people thought, okay, if I buy shares, I'll be rich. Unfortunately, I don't have the money to buy shares, so let's borrow some money. Yeah. And that was fine as long as these shares were worth a lot of money. But the moment then these shares go down, and you have a panic, and they go down and down, down and down, very, very, very quickly. Then suddenly, all your you don't have the the money anymore because that's what you've all borrowed. Yeah. Uh, and 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 then you go broke. Is that a sort of a fairly? I, th I think that's a, a sort of a reasonable explanation. In 1929. It's a reasonable maybe. explanation of most it, crashes. I mean, the, and but how is how is 2007, 2008? Different. Was, was it different? Well, the funny thing you get in the, in the world of money um, is that you get the phenomena that are, you can describe it as being exactly the same, um, or you can describe it as being completely different and okay. a completely new mm -hmm. thing in the particular. So, you know, if you're, um, there's a very good book about manias and mania, manias, panics, and crashes by a wonderful man called Charles Kilmanberger, and that, you know, his argument is. is um, you know, sort of, you've seen one, you've seen them all. I mean, the details are always different, but in a sense, the story's always the same. Um, a real phenomenon, because that's a crucial thing, it goes back to the South Sea bubble, which is a famous bubble in, the, in um, uh, England and in Western Europe more generally in the 18th century. And the, actually, there was a real thing there, the idea that exploration and um, uh, development internationally were going to change markets. There was a famous bubble around railway stocks and shares um, to, and, and the dot-com crash. You know, it's, it's, it's usually a real thing. Um, and the, in the 20s, um, America in particular had just industrialized very quickly. There were all sorts of new opportunities. There was a particularly game-changing new technology in the form of electricity suddenly becoming everywhere. So you could, you know, so a new thing comes along um, and 
then it, you have a, a normal a run-up in prices, people, that thing you describe of you know, people hearing about other people who are doing well, and then that gets carried away. It turns into a, a bubble, turns into that thing of you know, be, buying it on Monday and being rich by Friday, um, and then it implodes. And everyone loses money, especially people who have done the thing you describe of what's called in markets, they call it leverage, of borrowing money to basically magnify the scale of their bets and then you have a catastrophe and it yeah. takes some time to recover from. And one of the clear lessons from history, one of the things um, that was happened in 2007, 2008, is if it's, a fi if, it's, if it's a crisis inside finance, so not like the dot-com, which is about specific shares being worthless, or the South Sea bubble, whatever, but if it's a crisis actually inside the mechanisms of finance, they take longer to recover from. Because Why is that different? Because it jams up the supply of credit. Because Basically, we all need credit to buy our houses, businesses operate on credit, um, and things that paralyze the financial mechanism make it much harder to get credit, and it just, they, they always take longer to get over. And that's one of the distinct things about 2007, 2008. And the other distinct thing about it was, um, it was a sort of new, so if you were telling the story about how this time everything is different, which is another way you can tell it, um, it's partly about how, how it was global. Everything happened simultaneously everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was this one particular new kind of financial instrument um, based on poor people who had patchy credit history borrowing money to buy houses, famous subprime mortgages, as they're called. Um, and various uh, super smart people had convinced themselves that they'd engineered a form of insurance, a kind of wrapper around these mortgages. So you get lots of these mortgages together you take out a form of insurance and you've magically taken something risky and therefore high yielding because risk is always correlated mm -hmm. with reward. So it's risky and it pays more, but you've magically come up with a new trick to take away the risk through the insurance. And which is like saying you've invented an anti-gravity device or a perpetual motion machine. You know, it's actually sort of axiomatic in finance. Ri risk and reward are always mm -hmm. correlated, except no, no. Um, you know, far cleverer men than you or I have worked out a way of, of magically decoupling the two, so you get the high, high rewards but no risk, and everyone says, oh great, sounds fantastic, these instruments were bought, spread all around the financial system, because of that thing we were talking about earlier about derivatives get sold and reselled, actually no, so it was like a game of parsic parcel, except there's a bomb in it, and no one knows who's holding the parcel. Yeah. And then that's when the system jammed up and suddenly nobody knew who was broke because nobody knew who owned, who owned that debt. Yes. It's the analogy, no one knows who's ho holding the wheat, except in this instance it wasn't wheat, it was bundles yeah. of subprime mortgages. If we continue that story of how 2007, 2008 was different to 1929, was it not also different because a lot of the buying and selling was computer generated, so it was done automatically? Is that right or is that... Well, right? less so in uh, 2000. I mean, we've had other... Um, there have been a number of crises that were caused um, by automation. There was... Um, uh, the, the, the first one um, uh, was in 1987. It was actually, funny enough, it was the biggest... It was still bigger than the, the crash of 29 in terms of movement on a single day. Uh, I think people in this country may remember it because it was the Monday after the great storm, the Monday after that weekend. Um, and a backlog of orders had built up, sell orders that built up. It's not an unusual thing, to, especially on the weekend. And they, they started going through on the, on the Friday, they started going through on the Monday. And for some reason, um, that there was sufficient backlog to move the share prices just enough to start triggering automatic programs that had a then new thing called port portfolio insurance. The idea was that, uh, look, the computer will make sure you don't lose too much money. Instead of you having to check the price, oh, hell, it's gone down 10%, I better sell, the computer will do that for you. So you can never lose more than, what, would, what number would you like? So, oh, that's great, um, I don't want to ever lose more than 5%. Okay, so that's the number we put in. Um, but the problem was that everybody's portfolio insurance was running the same algorithms. So when the shares started dropping, suddenly all the computers noticed that the shares were dropping and they all started selling simultaneously. And the thing is that if, you, if you're selling into a falling market is famously a way of exacerbating the speed of the market and you can never quite, you, so the famous yeah. thing about trying to catch a falling knife, it's 
very dangerous and risky thing to do. Um, and so the, I think it was a 24% quarter of the value, trillions and trillions of dollars of the stock market value disappeared in one day, basically caused by um, a computer safety device that went wrong. And there have been re repetitions on that theme, I think called the flash crash in 2010, and an even bigger thing in the US bond market that for some reason is less well known, I think, because bonds are less sexy than shares. But there was a huge thing in the um, US Treasuries. And, and the US government debt is the biggest, most liquid, most studied market in the world. And a hundredth of a percent instant, you know, people, there are buyers and sellers at every price point. So a hundredth of people instantly buy or sell. And so the prices just don't move. So, what, and, so and you've got these computers based that yeah. run on algorithms, yeah. and then things go wrong, and the algorithms run on, as it were, exactly. even though the situation even though they're no longer fit for purposes, exactly. as it were. What do people do when that happens? Do they just sometimes maybe even literally unplug the computers? There have been instances when they've shut the market down. Um, and the, the thing about this bond crash, which I'm slightly fascinated by, so as I say, it was October 2014, and the, the price moved, I think it was like, it doesn't sound astonishing, it's like something like 2.3 and a bit to 1.7%, the yield. But because there are buyers at a, you know, a hundredth of a, percent. Um, th that was a thing that n no one had ever seen before in human history. And the, the, the statistical analysis, the probability, well, it, it was between a seven and eight sigma event. And in terms of probability, that means it's not supposed to happen except once every three billion years. Now, that le which, which is in plain English is saying it's impossible. Yeah, you know, it's like your glass of water suddenly spontaneously boiling because all the molecules are moving the same way. It just it can't happen, and yet it did in the bond market. And so they convened a conference, um, the f the Treasury convened a conference, and they got the Federal Reserve, they got academics, they got you know people who are active participants in the market, they got the regulators all together for a long weekend in a hotel in Washington, and the conclusion they came to was they don't know. It was something to do with algorithms, yeah. as you say, running away with themselves, because and they don't yeah. know, understand what happened. Because you, you talked about the, I don't know whether this is a word, uh, the unknowability of the product, so everyone sort of passing this buck, as it were, on and on, but they're basically kind of black boxes, and no one is absolutely sure what's in them. That was a big fun thing in 2007, 2008, in the crash, that these pools of mortgages were turned yes, into that's things that, 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 that that's the, people sell, you know, the people selling them and the people buying them didn't I mean, it was actually yeah. actually called a black but box. But the system was so they talk about also talk about banks being too big to fail. We can yeah. kind of understand what that means. Was the system also too opaque to the, the banks, if these financial in, uh, uh, institutions, not just too big to fail, but also too opaque to understand? Precisely because a lot of the stuff was running on algorithms and only sort of mathematicians could understand it, or was it not so much a point in oh, 2007, no, that, that's, 2008? That's def that was definitely a thing then, um, and, and it's a thing now. Um, you know, the, I mean, um, Andy Haldane, who's the Director of Stability at the Bank of England, um, and uh, he wrote a very interesting paper about it, making the point that some of these things have, some of the black boxes, have a billion lines of computer code inside them. Yeah. And the examples, you know, the wheat fields, that's a long, 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 long way away um, from the kind of thing we're talking about, with th talking about things about impossible, and I don't mean that metaphorically, I mean actually it is impossible um, for a single person to get their head around it, because as I said, it's a billion lines yeah. of computer code, you can't understand that. And that in turn means that, to my mind, it means they're in inherently unsafe. So that you're dealing with financial institutions that are too big, that are too opaque, too intransparent, and therefore, presumably, also no longer really manageable because even the CEO or the CFO doesn't really understand what the financial institution as a whole does. Is yes, that a fair I mean, assessment? Uh, it's a completely fair assessment. I think the thing that brings it home is um, my father was worked for a bank. Mm. He wasn't a banker in the modern sense. He worked for a, a sleepy colonial institution called the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank in the days when it was the 200th biggest bank in Asia. And it's now HSBC, which at one point was the second biggest bank in the world. And you know, people sometimes wonder, what, it, what would it be like if someone who actually was mainly interested in doing good ran one of these mm. institutions? What, you know, what would the culture be like? What effect would that have? Well, HSBC actually had an ordained priest in the Church of England, Stephen Green, as his head. Um, Non-metaphorically, he is actually a priest. 
He's written two books about ethics in banking and finance, and then he's, by all accounts, a very good man, a good person. And when he was chairman of the company, or chief executive, I can't remember which, um, there was a period during which HSBC, as we subsequently learned from a report from the American prosecutors, in Mexico, they had they were laundering money left, right and centre, but they were laundering money to such an extent that the bank teller's windows had specially cut holes in so they could take boxes of cash being dropped off by the drug dealers. The drug dealers had so much cash in these, presumably there were something like shoe boxes, that the normal windows wouldn't fit, so they cut special holes so the narcos could drop off their cash and they deposit it straight away. That's why the institution is actually run by an Anglican priest with a special interest in financial yeah. ethics. And what I think the lesson of that is that, firstly, the culture is very, very, very difficult to change. That was clearly the culture in that particular outpost of the organization. And secondly, it's not clear that these uh, institutions of that size and complexity at the global scale actually yeah. can be managed. That, that brings me to the question, where are we now? Uh, to, I mean, I'm going to ask you about the future. Uh, to quote uh, Jack, the people always say you can't predict the future, but how can they know? Yeah. Uh, so let's have a go. Um, could it happen again? I mean, I, I remember, you remember, uh, I think everyone who's, who's of a certain age remembers, 2008, 2009, there were, this was like Armageddon. There yeah. were magazines that had, on, had covers saying, you know, uh, is this the end of capitalism? And that's what actually what people thought, maybe not the end of the world or not yet but the end of that capitalism. And then only two years later, I remember a cover, uh, Newsweek, I think it was, 2010, the cover says, is this all, question mark. Yeah. And now it's back to business as usual. So that seems very strange, but it also mm. throws up this worrying question, could this happen again? It certainly could. I don't think the overall risks in the system are much reduced because the size and the complexity and the opacity and the speed are all the same. I think though, you know, I, I used to think, because, you know, lots of things weren't fixed after 2007-8, um, but I, I was very worried about a repetition of the crisis, mm. but actually thought that, you know, that the, the possible upside was that there couldn't be another bailout and return to normal, you know, that they had, they'd used up, governments and the financial system had used up that pass of well, let's just give them a ton of money and we'll bear the costs and the public will suffer and we'll just go back to the way things are and not change. You know, that because nothing had changed, it was likely to happen again. And then the time after, when it happened again, then it would be impossible for governments to, to repeat that trick of inaction. But actually, and so I thought that there would be another financial economic crisis that would feed into the political system. But actually I was wrong, and what happened is that the, effectively the political system broke first. Mm. Um, and things that were, which I'm talking about um, later as we speak, but in the past when people will be watching this in the Prokof lecture at Sheffield, is that you know, the things that would seem completely impossible in that, you know, beginning of 2008, George W. Bush was President of the United States, Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, Hu Jintao was Secretary General of the Communist Party, interest rates were 5.5%. And the idea that you'd have Donald Trump, Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn as head of the Labour Party, and Britain leaving the European Union would have been completely inconceivable. And I think really what happened is that anger at inaction, impunity, on the, especially on the part of the people who in the public imagination were responsible, and broadly speaking that's right, um, anger at that impunity has fed into our political system and so in effect that's the thing I thought the finance was going to break and that would feed into politics but actually what happened is the politics broke first. Yeah that's a fairly worrying assessment isn't it? Yes I mean it's whether you know whether you can have it's like that thing that people sometimes say that they go so for interrupting because then you've got two things the, the, the original problems aren't fixed yeah but the anger is now directed at foreigners, a certain kind of open world politics, globalization, uh, you know, so instead of doing things better politically, we're doing things less well without our having solved any of the financial problems. It is a worry. I mean, I think that if, 
if we could fix, I mean, I think what happened is that it fed into sort of sociological fault lines in our society, divisions that were already there, inside and outsiders, you know, sometimes talked about closed and open, which is a bit unfair, I think, because it makes people, you know, clo who wants to be closed? It's a very negative way of describing it. But um, older, older and younger, educated and less educated, city and country, all that, those fault lines were already there. It's just that the kind of crisis levered them apart a lot more. Um, I think it's a question really about, you know, there's sometimes, it, they talk about sometimes you can have a thing called almost a good heart attack that people have, a cardiac event, that, and it causes them to reevaluate their life yeah. and change how they live, and they end up living much longer as a result. And I'd hope that that was what the, f the financial crisis was. I wrote in Whoops, I wrote that saying, you know, please let it be that. And it wasn't. And perhaps for liberal democracy, the, the recent elections, and some of which, you know, we haven't talked about. I think people underrate the significance and the alarmingness of the things like the Hungarian election result, mm -hmm. which is an openly anti-democratic party that would have seemed impossibly sinister as recently as five years ago in the European context. And now apparently that's, that's, kind that's norm, normal kind for normal, the yeah. um, And I think that perhaps for liberal democracy, this is that equivalent of that health, the health scare and the people who believe in a liberal democratic order are basically going to have to raise their game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have to take this as a warning. And mm. it's, it's reversible, I'm sure it is, um, but it's not reversible if we just all act like nothing alarming is happening and okay. keep going on. I know you'll be exploring this uh, far more in your Prokhorov uh, Center lecture, uh, the crash uh, 10 years on. I've got one final question. Uh, if, uh, for our audience, you wanted to suggest one book other than your own books, one book and or one film about the crash of 2007-2009, which book and or film would you recommend? Um, I think, well, in a way, this, the answer for both um, is The Big Short, Michael Lewis's book, mm -hmm. um, which was made into um, a very effective film. I, I, he's a friend, and he said, when he said, told me uh, over dinner you know, they're making a movie of it. I said, I have to tell you, Michael, yeah, sorry, but it's not, po you know, it's too complicated, it can't be done, you know. Don't take this the wrong way, but it's impossible. But actually they did it very, very brilliantly by emphasising the bits that are kind of comic and grotesque. That's a very effective, um, they're both very effective. If, um, if, if someone wanted a book about, you know, because people often feel very baffled and that they don't have permission to understand finance and markets mm -hmm. and risk and things like that. The one, the one book I, I always recommend, it's not directly about these things, but it, it kind of gives you a, a sense of how it works. And it has a very kind of broad humanist, because actually the idea of managing risk is a great humanist project. It's not that, you know, not everything is determined by the gods or by fate. Uh, you know, we can understand and manage and control mm -hmm. some of what happens. And it's a book called uh, Against the Gods by Peter Bernstein. Um, and uh, I've, n I've never met anyone who, I've recommended it to lots of people who look very skeptical uh, at me when I was recommending it to them, but I've never met anyone who read it who didn't really appreciate that. Okay, work. that's great. And I can recommend your own books uh, as well. Oh, thank thank you. you very much for doing this interview. Thank you, Hank.